Well, thank you all so much today for joining us for protecting wildlife corridors to safeguard biodiversity and people. My name is Susan Holmes, and I'm the Federal Policy Director for the Wildlands Network, and I'll be your moderator today. Wildlands Network was founded by scientists and conservation advocates 30 years ago with the mission to reconnect, restore, and rewild North America. We advocate for science-driven policies to protect wildlife and their habitats. First, I would like to thank all our speakers and the community of people who is working so hard around the country to protect wildlife corridors. Today's webinar comes at an important time. Nature is in peril with 1 million species threatened with extinction from climate change, habitat, fragmentation, and development. But there is hope. You may have seen this video of a wildlife crossing from Interstate 80 in Utah, just up the street from our headquarters in Salt Lake City. This is an exciting example of the enormous potential of wildlife corridors and crossings and how these efforts to mitigate wildlife vehicle collisions have merged have emerged as one of the strongest, most popular and practical tools that we have to safeguard species. In fact, wildlife corridor protection is so effective that 12 states, including Virginia and New Mexico, who you will hear from today, have already taken strong action to safeguard wildlife corridors and crossings by passing legislation or creating corridor conservation programs. And this year we've seen the federal government advance bold legislation to protect wildlife corridors. Led by Senator Tom Udall and Representatives Don Beyer and Vern Buchanan, the Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act passed the U.S. House of Representatives this year as part of the Moving Forward Act stimulus package. This visionary bill would reconnect the landscape by establishing a wildlife corridor system on federal public lands and providing critical funding for states and tribes to protect their wildlife crossings. The same stimulus bill also includes 300 million in dedicated funding for road crossings which could help jumpstart the post-pandemic economy, uh, uh, economy by supporting rural jobs. Today, you will hear from representatives from states, tribes, and the outdoor recreation community, some of the broad coalition that has come together to reconnect wildlife habitat about both the conservation and the economic value of protecting wildlife corridors. As we prepare for a new Congress and a new administration, we hope that this webinar illustrates the vital importance and the opportunity that protecting wildlife corridors and crossings provides for all of us. And now a little bit of housekeeping. The first half of the webinar will consist of presentations from our experts. At 5.30, we will welcome Senator Tom Udall, who will speak and then be joined by other speakers for questions from the moderator. And the last 10 minutes will be an opportunity for your questions. So please send your questions to the Q&A function um, on the Zoom monitor. And finally, this webinar will be recorded if you want to share it with your friends and colleagues. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ron Sutherland. Dr. Sutherland is the chief scientist for the Wildlands Network where he leads the science team in their work to map, identify and protect wildlife corridors. He's worked to save 79,000 acres of Hoffman Forest in North Carolina and he received his PhD in environmental sciences from the Nicholas School at Duke University. Um, Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Susan. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity this afternoon to give you all a very brief introduction to the science behind wildlife corridor conservation. Let's start with a few key definitions, just so we're on the same page here. Habitat connectivity is simply the degree to which organisms are able to move freely across the landscape. Habitat connectivity can be very high, such as in a remote and intact wilderness, or it can be very low, such as in a, a city park surrounded on all sides by busy highways. Next slide. Now, a wildlife corridor is the term we use for a defined movement pathway. Actually, yeah, that's the right. And uh, that if, if that wildlife corridor were protected or restored, would, it would provide essential habitat connectivity for one or more species. They can be easy to see, like the corridor image on the left, where the vegetation really stands out from the farms. Other times, a wildlife corridor might be nearly invisible and defined more by the movements of the animals than by the vegetation. Now, many people get wildlife corridors and wildlife road crossings confused. I think social media is to blame for that. The two concepts are closely related. A wildlife road crossing, like the one on the right there, is a structure that is designed to allow wildlife to safely cross over or under a busy road. One of the best places to put wildlife road crossings is of course where you have a wildlife corridor that gets cut off by a highway. It also makes sense to put wildlife crossing structures on roads that pass through the middle of large core areas, such as Banff National Park, which is shown here. So hopefully that helps clear up that distinction. Next slide. <clears throat> Why should we protect and restore wildlife corridors? 
Well, let's find out by talking about the movement needs of four different species. Upper left, we have the grizzly bear, which is a poster child for an animal that needs a ton of room to roam. 500 female grizzly bears could use as much as 20 million acres of land, which is hard for any one park to provide. But if we can stitch parks, stitch together parks with wildlife corridors, the full network of habitat may provide enough space to maintain a viable population. The same thing is true for smaller species like box turtles that use two acres. Just the habitat network can exist at a smaller scale, the corridors can be smaller. And then you've got species like the monarch butterfly, which is famous for making a complicated multi-generational migration every year across North America. The monarch needs appropriate habitat along its seasonal migration routes to survive. The same is true for many other species that move on a seasonal basis. And the, the cheap mountain salamander comes to mind as a species that may be highly threatened by climate change. These salamanders live on just a few mountains at high elevation in West Virginia, and as their environment gets warmer and drier, they're going to need to move northwards, ideally, to keep up with their preferred conditions or risk being run off the mountain by competitor species coming up from below. Mountain salamanders in general pose a special connectivity challenge as the, the group of mountains that they're found on now may not actually connect very well to similar mountains further north at the same elevation. For most other species though, climate connectivity is not as complicated. If we want wildlife to survive climate change, we need to make sure they can move in the right direction to keep up with their preferred conditions as they have for millions of years. And lastly, here's a Florida panther, a subspecies of mountain lion that was nearly destroyed by the negative impacts of inbreeding. The last 20 panthers ended up stuck in South Florida with no one to breed with but their siblings and their cousins and the consequences of that isolation were severe. In the case of the Florida Panther, since there were so few left, the solution ended up being bringing men mountain lions from Texas. And this provided a short-term boost to the genetic diversity of the population. Long-term, ideally, we have to establish a network of cougar populations at a grand scale in the South if we want these cats to survive on their own. In reality, each of these four factors are often quite important for the same species. And the same corridors, if they are designed well, can meet the connectivity needs of multiple species at the same time. Next slide. So that's why corridors are important. How do we find them? And once we've found them, how do we protect them? The gold standard for identifying wildlife corridors is to track a set of the target animals and figure out where they go. That's what, that is what we've done for species like elk in Wyoming, shown in the image on the left from USGS. And I think Aaron Johnson will talk more about ungulate corridors in a moment. But if we don't have good data, which is often the case, we can also generate GIS-based computer models of animal movement to predict where species will be traveling. And in many places, a healthy amount of common sense and Google Earth images can actually get you pretty far when trying to map out these corridors. Once you have them identified, protecting them should be relatively straightforward. If the land is already public, say a national forest, then we need a system for officially delineating and reserving the corridor and protecting it from abuses such as mining or road building. If the land is private, then we need a mix of both buying the land from willing sellers when that's appropriate and paying and incentivizing landowners to maintain the corridor themselves. So lastly, in some places, the cord, wildlife corridor doesn't exist anymore, but it could be restored. We can plant trees, restore grassland, et cetera. That's where the, the creative side of wildlife corridors comes in. And of course, a big part of restoring habitat connectivity is also building those wildlife road crossings we've talked about where corridors cross busy roads. So that's the introduction. Thanks very much. I hope that was useful. And I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thank you so much, Ron. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Aaron Johnson is the wildlife biologist for the Southern Ute Indian Tribe in southwestern Colorado. Over the past 17 years, Aaron has worked extensively on increasing the tribe's knowledge of how mule deer and elk move on and off the reservation seasonally. These efforts have led to a unique partnership between the tribe and the state of Colorado to design and fund two wildlife crossings on US Highway 160 within the reservation. Aaron will be talking to us today about his experiences in southwest Colorado. Thank you, Aaron. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's really exciting to see so many participants. So I'm really happy to be here um, and to address all of you this afternoon on the subject of connected landscapes and wildlife migration corridors. Next slide. Um, connected landscapes mean many things to many people, but mainly the idea invokes thoughts of wildlife completing natural cycles unimpeded. We think of things like bird migrations and salmon runs and ungulate migrations that I'll focus on today in my comments. Our rapidly developing and changing world continues to convert, fragment, and isolate habitats that our wildlife rely on as seasonal ranges and migration corridors. The good news is that driven by instinct or memory, many animals such as our native ungulates continue their migrations despite anthropogenic threats including things like climate change, ex-urban, and energy development, 
as well as transportation infrastructure that can act as barriers. But the threats cannot be ignored or remain unmitigated. Next slide. Not addressing threats to connected landscapes and migration corridors has implications on multiple fronts, not the least of which is the animals ultimately losing their ability to migrate. But let's use one specific threat as an example. In Colorado, we know that roadways have significant impacts on our migratory ungulate herds. Colorado Parks and Wildlife shows us that about 2% of our mule deer herd is killed annually on our roads. The mule deer herd numbers about 418,000 animals. In our state, we suffer nearly 4,000 wildlife vehicle collisions annually, many of which result in human injuries and fatalities. And all this costs, costs our state economy $66.4 million annually, not including the value of the animals themselves. Impacts to Indian country must also be taken into account. These impacts include all the things I just mentioned, herd health of our animals, human safety and economics. But on top of those, there are sovereignty considerations as well as cultural and spiritual needs of native people that are lost when animals cannot complete their annual cycles. Native connections to the land and everything on it, under it and over it is universal. Native people have traditional, cultural, and spiritual ties to flora and fauna that endure today, but those ties can be strained when access to them is limited. So you can imagine that the ability for native wildlife to move within traditional and cultural landscapes and to return to the people is incredibly important. Tribal lands encompass about 140 million acres in the United States, but Indian country is often overlooked. Dedicated funding sources for identifying and conserving migration corridors and enhancing their habitats is vitally important. Consider how the 11 Western states have reacted to Secretarial Order 3362 funding. There's been immediate increases in research, modeling and understanding of ungulate migrations and in identifying and mitigating threats posed to them. Should legislation such as the Wildlife Corridor Conservation Act, the Tribal Wildlife Corridor Act, or the wildlife crossing portion of the transportation bill pass with dedicated funding, there will be a similar response in Indian country, which again, cannot be overlooked if we want a whole picture of migrations on our Western landscapes. This final slide shows the efforts that the Southern Ute Indian tribe has put forth in recent years to understand how mule deer and elk migrate in and out of the reservation. The tribe has taken a lead role in collecting data and working with federal and state agencies as well as the private sector to identify our ungulate migration corridors and to address and mitigate threats such as a highway bisecting those corridors. These types of projects are indicative of what could be happening more often in Indian country if dedicated funding sources in the Wildlife Corridor Conservation Act, the Tribal Wildlife Corridor Act, or the wildlife crossing portion of the transportation bill becomes available. Thank you for your time this afternoon and um, back to you, Susan. Thank you, Aaron. And for those of you who may have joined a little bit later, I just want to remind you that if you would like to ask a question of the panelists later, um, please use the Q&A function um, on your screen. Um, and now I would like to introduce Stephanie Garcia Richard. Um, Commissioner Garcia Richard is the first woman, the first Latina and the first educator to serve in the position of New Mexico's Commissioner of Public Lands. She grew up in a family that operated ranches on the Eastern Plains and Northern Mountains of New Mexico, sparking the strong connection uh, to our land that she holds today. She was elected to the New Mexico House of Representatives in 2012 and was elected land commissioner in 2018. As land commissioner, Stephanie is uh, focused on raising revenue for New Mexico while always keeping an eye towards stewardship and preserving the land for generations to come. Thank you so much, Commissioner Richard. Garcia Richard. Thank you, Susan. Uh, it's my privilege to be here with you all today. Um, and before I even get into my remarks, I would like to uh, do a land acknowledgement. So I come to you today from the pristine uh, Hamas Mountain Range in Northern New Mexico, which is the ancestral homeland of the Tewa people, uh, specifically the Hamas Pueblo, Cochiti Pueblo, um, San Ildefonso Pueblo. And so, uh, you know, we, we really um, 
we really try to remember, as, as Aaron said, um, the traditional way that, that this land was cared for and stewarded by those um, ancestral folks and in hope that that informs the way that we steward land today. So I have a, a very unique role. I am the land manager for 13 million acres of state trust land, uh, whose primary role is to raise revenue for New Mexico's public schools, hospitals, and universities. And we do that by leasing for agricultural uses, um, commercial and business development, uh, oil and gas development, things like that. And it's always sort of been in the past, um, a, the nature of this office to kind of make short-term financial decisions um, at the expense of long-term stewardship outcomes. And so it is my number one priority in this office to turn that around um, and to really look at how do we balance revenue generation with long-term sustainable land management decisions so that we can preserve the resource for, for future generations. Um, and I, you, you all will forgive me if I just very briefly greet um, my US Senator. Uh, who is sort of the star of this call. He just joined us uh, on his camera. So Senator Udall, thank you for being here. Um, so the Wildlife Corridors Movement, um, the, the Wildlife Corridors Act that was passed in the state legislature in New Mexico really lends, lends itself to this type of land management that I'm talking about. Um, ensuring that the decisions we're making on development. So you, you've been hearing about like, you know, development decisions um, transportation routes, things like that, ensuring that those decisions are not negatively impacting our quality of life, the, the uh, cleanliness of our air, land, water, and wildlife health. And that includes uh, ensuring, you know, wildlife uh, connectivity and, and corridors. And so, you know, I, I get questions from folks when I'm so, uh, when I come out in such strong advocacy for, for this movement, like don't you think that you're gonna um, impede development by supporting something like wildlife corridors? And to me, those things go hand in hand. And I really want to have, it's my dream to have a, a, a more well-rounded approach to land management that is sound, sustainable, science-based. And I believe that that approach to land management will properly address the need for wildlife connectivity. Um, at the state land office, uh, we in the past have always approached development as kind of like a one-off. Uh, when folks come to us for a, an idea for leasing land, um, we, we sort of look at that in isolation. But recently we uh, were given um, nonprofit uh, dollars to hire the first ever landscape level planner at the land office. And you can bet that one of her first jobs was to start collaborating with folks um, on a wildlife corridors package for the state land office. And she's been working with some area uh, universities, some nonprofits, um, some landowners in order to just kind of beef up what, what are the sort of latest um, science-based uh, processes that, that um, lead, lend themselves to a strong uh, wildlife corridor policy. Um, this, this member of our staff uh, is going to be responsible for the state land office's portion of our state wildlife corridors act. Um, and I, I'm, I know that we're gonna hear from a Virginia delegate a little bit later on who passed you know, his state's version of, of the wildlife corridors act. Uh, New Mexico was actually the, the very first state to pass legislation of this kind. And it calls on a number of agencies, including the agency I represent, um, to really collaborate in ensuring that when we have future development that's being proposed, when we have current development, that we, are ha that we have a lens towards a plan to, uh, to include the, the, the um, that we include you know, wildlife uh, concerns. So this uh, long-term planner is going to do things like working on restoration of habitat, um, recommending infrastructure improvements to our lessees, uh, 
to recommend maybe alternate locations of certain businesses or developments, restore biodiversity hotspots, and work on infrastructure improvements such as box culverts and fence modifications. So that's what we are doing at the state land office. But I think as the, the uh, Senator Udall's Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act shows us is that we cannot work in isolation and in silos. We need a federal response to wildlife management. Um, we, need, we need to ensure that um, agencies are being mandated to work together. Um, and that is you know, both state agencies, tribal governments, um, so, that, so that folks are working in tandem, in coordination, and we don't have kind of this patchwork approach um, we need, definitely need this, this federal legislation. And so it is just my great privilege to be here today to help advocate for this very necessary um, uh, federal legislation and, and what it will bring and what it means to land managers and landowners, especially in the West, um, because of, of the patchwork nature of, of what we do here. Um, the data that it will mandate and that, that shared nature of that data is desperately needed for us to make land management decisions. Incentives for landowners you heard about earlier. Um, and most importantly, you know, promoting public safety and a critical uh, landscape level planning, which is something we've already started to do at the state land office. So for the future generations of Americans and New Mexicans that we are responsible for stewarding these resources for, um, it is crucial that we support this legislation, that this legislation gets passed, and it's my uh, absolute privilege to be here with you today. And I look forward to further discussion and to the question and answer period. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Garcia Richard. Um, it's now my privilege to uh, turn this over to Megan Wolf. Megan Wolf is Patagonia's environmental campaigns and activism manager based in Reno, Nevada. She currently oversees the company's campaigns and advocacy work related to lands and waters, including creating and protecting wildlife corridors on land and in waterways. Megan sits on the board of directors for Friends of Nevada Wilderness. She's a founding member of the Nevada Outdoor Business Coalition and uh, that is a voice for healthy lands and waters that are critical to a robust outdoor recreation economy. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Megan. Thank you, thanks for having me. Uh, I'd like to thank you Wildlands Network for hosting this discussion and uh, Senator Udall for introducing the Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act. Um, and I am speaking to you today from the ancestral homeland of the Washu tribe. There are uh, direct economic impacts and various wildlife related activities that are important to overall national uh, GDP and especially important to many rapidly diversifying rural economies across the country. As of the latest Bureau of Economic Analysis report from 2019, the outdoor recreation economy generates $788 billion in consumer spending and 5.2 million jobs each year. Taken all together, outdoor businesses represent a huge range of activities, fishing, bird watching, uh, hunting, hiking, camping, and conservation. We know the economic impact of the various activities within the overall industry. For example, hunting and angling contribute over $200 billion to the economy. These activities most often support local economies in rural America and generate state and local taxes. Protecting wildlife corridors and crossings is a vital strategy for protecting game species such as brook trout, waterfowl, mule deer, pronghorn, and elk. Hunters and sportsmen are largely supportive of wildlife crossings as they help ensure healthy big game populations. As a business in this industry, we have a voice, but our voice will not survive if we don't protect the resources uh, our business will not survive if we do not protect the resources that support it. And that means protecting our land, air, water, and wildlife. We rely on healthy natural places where people can recreate and wildlife can thrive. For over 30 years, Patagonia has given 1% of sales to grassroots environmental organizations. Over that time, we've invested $23 million alone into biodiversity and species protection. We believe strongly in preserving critical migration corridors so wildlife can have freedom to roam. Many of America's most treasured wildlife, including the grizzly bear, bighorn sheep, bull trout, and dozens of salmon runs are threatened by habitat loss and fragmentation. Yellowstone is a prime example. Yellowstone National Park is dependent on surrounding areas to help maintain wildlife in the park because many 
species, species uh, migrate in and out of the park seasonally. US 20 is a heavily trafficked road to the park. We've been in, uh, recently begun supporting a group near there, the Henry's Fork Wildlife Alliance, an Idaho group working to build public support for badly needed wildlife crossings on US 20. Sand Creek Desert west of US 20 provides winter range for mule deer, elk, and moose, which move to and from the desert in the spring and fall, with many having to cross US 20 on their travels to and from their habitats in and adjacent to the park. Grizzly bears and wolverines have important connectivity areas across the upper Henry's Fork and across US 20. So wildlife crossings help these species as well. Outdoor recreation activities are the main economic driver in this region, supporting towns like Ireland Park and West Yellowstone. Just as people need roads and highways to travel from, place, uh, from one place to, the, to another, fish, uh, large mammals, and even plants need movement corridors connecting natural communities. Outdoor recreationists likewise seek uninterrupted and undeveloped wild landscapes to traverse and explore. Migration is key to the survival of most wildlife and in turn ourselves. The Wildlife uh, Corridors Conservation Act will provide key tools for conserving our nation's wildlife and natural heritage for future generations. The act would also directly support the outdoor recreation industry and the many local and state businesses that benefit from that industry. Thank you again and I'll turn it back over to Susan. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, now I'd like to introduce Bridget Donaldson. Bridget is an Associate Principal Research Scientist with the Virginia Transportation Research Council, which is the research division of the Virginia Department of Transportation. She has 17 years of experience in ecology and transportation research, and she has implement, studied and implemented successful wildlife crossing projects in Virginia, and is a co-founder of the Virginia Safe Wildlife Borders Collaborative. Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Um, so as you know, roads are pretty much everywhere and roads are quite skilled at fragmenting wildlife habitat. So by targeting roads for structures like wildlife crossings, which can keep those habitats connected or can reconnect the hab habitat, it opens up many opportunities to create an impact on wildlife connectivity. Next slide, please. So driver safety is a main focus of every Department of Transportation and the most effective safety measures and these um, are an example of these are in orange text that are highlighted in a federal highway administration report. Um, and those in the orange text have an effectiveness of between 20 and up to 50%. And that is very effective in the highway safety world, which is why when I told a couple of my safety engineer colleagues that our wildlife crossing study uh, reduced wildlife crashes by over 90%, they kind of politely nodded and looked at me like I did my study wrong. But these kinds of numbers have been shown time and again with wildlife crossing research with effectiveness of between usually 85 to up to 97%. Next slide, please. So despite those high numbers showing their effectiveness in crash reduction, wildlife crossings are far from common in the US. And part of this is likely due to the data that we have access to. And I talk a lot about deer crashes um, here in part because it's the only data that most states have on wildlife crashes. So we know from insurance claims that in the US we have about one and a half million crashes with deer, elk, and moose. 60,000 of these are in Virginia. But DOTs and other organizations use police report data to make decisions on road projects. But we found that less than 10% of deer and bear crashes are documented in police reports. Most people just don't call the police when they, when they hit an animal unless they're injured. And, and for the most part, there's no other species that are listed in those police reports. But once you start collecting wildlife carcass data or roadkill data, uh, which can be done by DOT maintenance staff or even citizen science apps, the true wildlife crash numbers kind of come out of the woodwork. So once we asked the contractor who removed roadkill on I-64 in Virginia to document those numbers for us, we saw that deer crashes, according to the deer carcass removals, is many times higher than the largest police reported crash type. In this case was rear end crashes and loads of other wildlife species were also documented from that data. So these numbers that actually reflect reality are pretty devastating and this is what gets people listening. Next slide, please. So the ideal wildlife crossings are those that lie typically in a series along the road and are connected by fencing. So they're much more um, cost effective when they're constructed during a new road project or even a maintenance project and when they're strategically designed and located. 
But when constructing new crossings is not an option, one effective approach is to make better use of existing structures that weren't designed for wildlife. So we took two existing structures on I-64, which was a large bridge that was over a river and a box culvert, neither of which were originally designed for wildlife. And we simply added one mile of eight foot high wildlife fencing at each site, extending from the openings to along the road. Um, and because of the crash reduction that we saw of over 90%, and because of the relatively low cost of the fencing, there's an estimated savings, mostly from vehicle property damage, at each of those sites of over $2 million over the lifetime of the fencing. Next slide, please. So there are obvious benefits to drivers, and of course, wildlife also benefit immensely. So once we added that fencing to these underpasses, which helped create more of a true corridor to funnel wildlife movement, Black bears started using it, they never had before. Um, and crossings by deer quadrupled and used by every other terrestrial mammal in the area also greatly increased. We now have thousands of crossings in these structures every year. And next slide. So in the US, we have the tools to support decisions on wildlife crossing construction. We have the evidence of their effectiveness and we have a good handle of the des designs that work for different species. We have existing and ongoing mapping efforts to support decisions about their placement, and more states are using apps to document that important roadkill data. Um, many states and regions have collaboratives, like our Virginia Safe Wildlife Corridors Collaborative, and um, those are made up of dozens of organizations that support these measures. So we're ready to hit the ground running, and wildlife crossings can become a more common consideration in our transportation planning process if they are prioritized through leadership support and funding and general public awareness. So thanks very much. And Susan will introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Bridget. And now I'd like to introduce Senator David Marsden. Senator Marsden is a juvenile justice policy and practice expert who was elected in 2005 to the Virginia House of Delegates. And in 2010, he was elected to the state Senate where he represents Fairfax County in Northern Virginia. Senator Marston has a well-earned rep reputation as a hardworking legislator who gets things done for the Commonwealth. He was the lead sponsor of the Virginia Wildlife Corridors Bill, which passed thanks to his advocacy with bipartisan support and was signed by the governor this year. Thank you so much for joining us, Senator Marston. Well, thank you all so much for having me. It's good to be here. Thank you, Susan. And, uh, you know, uh, as, as I was thinking about what to say, it, you know, it, it really annoys me that our founding fathers back in the, uh, the late 1700s didn't recognize the, uh, the potential for, uh, for wildlife problems here in this country and zone the nation so that we already had pre-existing uh, animal uh, crossings and, and, and corridors throughout the, the, the country. So now we have to go back and stitch this thing together because of, uh, well, they were just lazy, I guess. But uh, uh, we were real pleased to get the uh, the wildlife corridor bill uh, through this year, which puts the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries and VDOT together to really start identifying uh, places where we can uh, uh, protect wildlife and protect property damage here in the Commonwealth. It's a six billion dollar problem in this country, and uh, the the uh, uh, the incidence of uh, of hitting. Uh, deer, especially at night, came home to me in 2001 uh, when we had a situation in Virginia. I headed up the Department of Juvenile Justice and we had to get workers out of bed in the middle of the night when children were arrested who, to go in and do the paperwork. And the biggest concern that my court directors had was a single parent with an eight-year-old sleeping in the backseat of a car driving 45 minutes through a rural area uh, to get to where a police officer had arrested a youngster uh, to, uh, 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 th with the fear that they would be uh, striking a deer uh, and putting their lives in jeopardy. So we put together a, uh, uh, a teleconferencing system so that police could access these workers without dragging them out of bed at night. And uh, so what you think about in terms of the danger of animals crossing our highway is, is very, very real. Uh, and, and, in, and in many rural areas in Virginia, uh, at the forefront of people's minds when they're when they're driving at night and when their loved ones are out on the are out on the road, uh, the cost to uh, property damage is significant, and it's all reflected in the insurance rates that you pay on your cars 
uh, when uh, uh, when these accidents have to be actuarialized into the uh, the cost of providing insurance and, and making the automobile repairs. Now, I live in, in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is a, a jurisdiction of over 1.1 million people, about 12 miles uh, outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, we don't have uh, a significant ability to, to connect wildlife areas as much as we have a need you know, to find ways of getting animals across some of the major uh, parkways that we have here in, in, in Fairfax County. Uh, what the deer use here in, in my part of the world, I live 200 yards from the railroad tracks and that becomes their wildlife corridor. It leads from nowhere to nowhere, uh, but it does provide them with a, with a safer passage and places to nest and, uh, and uh, 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 raise, their, raise their young, which is uh, not really particularly appropriate. And my wife and I, we try to have pollinator gardens. We have a whole lot of them. And uh, the, the deer, and I'm held personally responsible for this, uh, come in the middle of the night and eat my wife's flowers, which robs the bees and the butterflies and everybody else of the pollinating opportunities that they would have enjoyed otherwise. So it, it creates problems here in a suburban area. Uh, and I envy the folks there in New Mexico and the different rural parts of the country with those beautiful vistas and wildlife and bears, you know, uh, crossing uh, uh, over the highways and, and connecting up these regions. But here in, in my county, the only way we can safely eliminate deer is to bring out bow hunters uh, to, uh, to, to get them off of, of our property. If we can find better ways of allowing them to, uh, to get to more natural environments, uh, we could go a long way towards solving some of the problems we have, especially in our exurban regions. Uh, the, the rural areas kind of, uh, uh, that, that's a, you know, a, a much larger issue, but it's uh, when, when you've got animals crossing highways where the, the speed limit is 60, 65 miles an hour, uh, that is a real problem. And I'd like to do a shout out to VDOT and the Virginia, Depart the Virginia Department of Transportation for the experiment that they did on I-64 to, to put that, uh, uh, that crossing in and put the fencing in that directed the, uh, that, that sort of herded the animals towards the crossing. Uh, and it, uh, it, it, it allows for populations to maintain health, for breeding health, uh, for uh, an ability to roam and, and find food and stay out of my wife's flowers, which is a big deal in my household. So uh, at any rate, I wanna thank you all for pulling this uh, conference together. Wildlife Corridors is, is a way of, proving, of improving the, the, the lives of, of all of us uh, by keeping animals in an area where they can do what they do best and that we can stay away from them and do the things that we do best and uh, that we can enjoy each other's company under only appropriate circumstances. So thank you all very much and uh, we will, uh, uh, look forward to the rest of the uh, of the conference. Thanks so much for having me tonight. Thank you so much, Senator Marsden. It was a pleasure to work with you on that legislation in Virginia. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce U.S. Senator Tom Udall and to take this opportunity to thank him for his many years of advocacy for conservation and especially for his leadership um, in the protection of wildlife corridors. Senator Udall began serving in the Senate in 2009 after two decades of public service in the U.S. House of Representatives and as New Mexico's Attorney General. Following in the great conservation tradition of the Udall family, Senator Udall is one of the foremost conservation and environmental leaders in Congress and in our nation, and is an advocate for upholding our nation's trust and treaty obligations to Native American tribes. Senator Udall has championed our public lands and the protection of natural resources through his time in office, He's been a leading champion at the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is now on track to become fully and permanently funded as initially proposed by his father, Stuart Udall in 1964. He's working hard to pass his bold 30 by 30 resolution to save nature, to protect at least 30% of the lands of the country's lands and waters by 2030. And uh, his Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act to establish wildlife corridors on federal and tribal lands that you've already heard so much about today. As the lead Democrat on the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee overseeing the Department of Interior, uh, Indian Health and the Bureau of Indian Education, he has successfully fought for increases for those agencies in the face of inadequate budget, uh, budgets and proposed cuts. And although Senator Udall is not seeking another term in the Senate this year, we are so grateful that he is not retiring from public life and will continue the fight for the issues he cares about 
Thank you, Senator Udall, for your many years of advocacy and for speaking with us today. Susan, th thank you so much for that. Just a very, very nice introduction. And it was wonderful uh, listening to all of your speakers. I, I think I caught almost everybody. I think Aaron was on there, Megan, Bridget, um, Stephanie, obviously, pretty amazing. And then Senator, Senator uh, Marston. Senator Marsden, I wanted to say one thing that just uh, went specifically to your issue. You know, in the West, we had, before the West was brought into the United States, we had an explorer named John Wesley Powell. And he said, when you bring it in, you ought to create states around watersheds. And we never did that either. And that was Congress's fault. Susan, um, I are have, you? I, yeah, I have some questions for you, Senator Udall. Should I jump in here? Go ahead, you jump in. I just sure. wanted to just recognize these wonderful speakers and just tell them that, that you know, they, they really hit it on the head and then go ahead, Susan, go for it. <laughs> no, you're, you're great. Well, uh, my first question for you is today, um, Senator, you wrote that wildlife corridors offer us some measure of hope and are the strongest tools that we have to safeguard uh, species. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to introduce the Wildlife Corridors Conservation Act and the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Bill and give us a brief overview of the legislation, in particular how the bill would support tribal lands and state wildlife corridor efforts? You bet. I, I introduced my uh, wildlife corridors legislation because we're staring down two crises at once. The climate crisis, which is uh, more well known and the nature crisis and safeguarding and improving wildlife migration corridors helps both of those. Here in the US, uh, we're losing a football field size of nature every 30 seconds. That's, if you go big picture, that's 1.5 million acres per year of natural habitat loss. We've lost 30% of total number of birds uh, since 1970. The US has lost half of its wetlands in the lower 48 states. And worldwide, we're experiencing the sixth mass extinction in the history of the earth. Scientists estimate approximately 1 million species threatened nationwide over the next few decades. It's not enough just to do better than the Trump administration or right their wrongs. We have to be bold and we have to think big. My wildlife quarters bill provides some tools for us to do they help the government do what's right. It helps people work across political subdivisions and land ownership patterns, both public and private, which animals ignore anyway and have people uh, work together. That's one of the big points is working together. And I think all of you talked about it from your different perspectives, how we would work together. It allows us to have scientists say where wildlife corridors are and then get to work making them safer for wildlife and us. It creates tools for us to take down both physical and bureaucratic barriers. And I'm glad you mentioned the tribal quarters bill. Indigenous people have been good stewards of the land for millennia. We all have a lot to learn from them. The tribal quarters bill highlights mostly existing authorities tribes already have under statutes and treaties to manage their lands and protect species important to them in their area. And tribes have done important work protecting critical species like the bison, and they can help show us the way, I think. Susan, back to you. Thank you, Senator Udall. Uh, another question for you. Um, in 1963, your father, Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall, in his book, The Quiet Crisis, raised concerns about the destruction of nature. This year, you introduced the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature a resolution to set a national goal of protecting 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. Can you talk about how protecting wildlife corridors is an important component of this 30 by 30 vision? You, you bet, thank you. I, I've just talked about the alarming statistics on size and scale of the nature crisis which we face. 30 by 30, for those of you who don't know, is the idea that we need to save 30% of our lands and waters by 2030, not far away. I have a bill, S-372, the Senate resolution to save nature that would set a national goal of doing just that. We have about a dozen co-sponsors. My uh, 
a very good friend and colleague, Congresswoman Deb Holland, is the sponsor of the House Companion. And we've been fortunate to have President-elect Biden include 30 by 30 in both his campaign platform and in announcements for early action in his presidency. And I think we're going to see an executive order on that front. If we're going to protect species with more protected lands, both public and private lands in some type of conservation status, then we have to connect them. It's just that simple. 30 by 30 is a bold goal. We currently have about 12% of our public lands protected and about 26% of our waters. To reach 30 by 30, by 2030, we will need more, we will need to protect more federal lands and the Great American Outdoors Act is a good down payment. It permanently funds $900 million a year in land acquisition for federal lands, state and local lands. We also have to work on better incentives for working lands and private lands, things like reforestation, better grazing, more sustainable agriculture, protecting wildlife corridors really just ties the whole thing together. Animals don't respect land ownership maps, so we have to make it easier for them to do what they need to do and go where they need to go. Back to you, Susan. Thank you, Senator. Now I'm gonna broaden the discussion out a little bit to include Senator Marsden and Commissioner uh, Garcia Richard, as well as Senator Udall. I have a question for you about uh, increasing bipartisan and public support for uh, wildlife corridors. We, as we can see, the states, both red and uh, blue and purple are moving on wildlife corridor protection. And we have the bipartisan wildlife corridor bill that's passed the house this year. Can you talk a little bit about how we can continue to build bipartisan support for wildlife corridors? And particularly, why is it important to have the federal bill as well as the state legislation? Susan, I'll jump in. Conservation and nature are popular. In February 2019, nation, a nationwide poll said 86% of respondents said they support 30 by 30. Even as a strong majority self-identified registered Republicans uh, clocked in at 76% support. If you wonder why President Trump suddenly flipped his longstanding opposition to the Land and Water Conservation Fund and signed the Great American Outdoors Act this summer, which permanently funds LWCF at 900 million a year to acquire new conservation lands, you don't have to look further than these figures in this popular support. Conservation is where the votes are. I think we'll continue to see these patterns with some of my Republican colleagues in the Congress who will change their mind on these issues as we move forward and find popular success. Thank you, and uh, uh, Commissioner Garcia Richard. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, so in addition to, you know, everything that the senator mentioned at the federal level, um, who doesn't love animals? I'm sorry, but like it, it, it's a little bit of a um, uh, a, a base level issue for folks. I mean, um, everyone I know in New Mexico, no matter their political affiliation, has a story about how wildlife has impacted them. And they're not all sports people. They're not all outdoors people. They, um, folks really connect with, with the wildlife um, population. And I think we should hook into that. I think that um, there've been some great suggestions. I've been reading the Q and A. There've been some great suggestions on like, you know, whether we should change the graphics on this so that it's clearer for people. Because obviously, um, you know, to, to see a herd of elk is very clear. To see a bear family is very clear. But what are we truly talking about? Um, in terms of, of fragmented and, and connectivity, um, you know, so that people can have a, an idea of that um, in their minds of, of, of what truly we're talking about. I also just want to say, and I said this before, um, you know, it, it doesn't help for New Mexico to have its own plan that stops at the border of Colorado because the I-25 goes, you know, all the way north. And so in order for us to really comprehensively uh, address this situation, it must be regional, it must be federal. And so I just, you know, once again, just the, the federal legislation is, is key um, yeah. for us to really do the job we need to do. Great. Susan? Hi, this is Dave Marsden. 
Go ahead, Senator. Yeah, thank you. It is, uh, it's a great question. Uh, I've got a few uh, rock solid, uh, re you know, Republican uh, folks who are hunters, they care about the land, they're large landowners. Uh, they've been really supportive in these things. And then I've got some what I call shoulder supporters uh, who kind of roll their eyes and go, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I guess this stuff's important. It's not particularly important to them, but they recognize on some level uh, that it is critical that there's, uh, that, that really, it, it is a conservative movement to protect property and life uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, damage to, to, to vehicles. And it, it's, it's uh, so you do get some, some support uh, there. Uh, in, in my political party, I'm a Democrat in Virginia. I only have a couple of my colleagues on, on my side of the aisle that have just small parts of rural Virginia in their districts. The rest are, have uh, become all, all, uh, all Republican. And one of the big problems we're having is that land, which used to exist in very, very large uh, tracts uh, back in the day, have been divided and sold up. Uh, to uh, smaller farmers, smaller uh, people are moving from urban areas to, to, to buy small farms for retirement and what have you. And we're having huge problems around uh, deer hound hunting uh, with, uh, with dogs, which are, which are putting people on roads, shooting down roads at deer crossing those roads. Uh, the deer are being flushed out onto, uh, onto public uh, uh, highways. And uh, it, it has become a huge battle between property owners and their property rights and uh, those who want to hunt, uh, hunt deer uh, with, with hunting dogs. And uh, so, you know, there, there are all kinds of problems around wildlife movement and where they are and people's access to them. And, and the wildlife corridors movement, you know, getting deer, you know, away from some of these areas and into more natural habitats where, uh, where we have the room to hunt with dogs or the room to hunt any way you like. Which is a cherished American tradition, but right now we're we're, we're using our roads for uh, uh, for gun sites, and uh, it's really dangerous and it's really a problem. And this movement is is part of fixing some of that. Thank you so much, Senator. Well, now I'm going to turn to some of the questions that we're getting um, on Facebook and uh, in our question and answer um, uh, chat function. Um, and one question is coming through loud and clear, and people are asking. What can the general public do in their respective states to support wildlife crossings and to share how crucial they are? And I'm gonna turn first to Senator Udall and then I'll, I'll turn to some of the other panelists as well. Yeah, I, and, I, and I think our other panelists can really address it <clears throat> at the local level, why they would like to see local and state level support. But at the federal level, the legislation that we have that I've talked about uh, get your senators and get your House members signed up. We have bills that exist. I think all of you that, that like to uh, be citizen lobbyists, you know, you, you advocate through letters and email and visits, but we don't have as many visits nowadays, but you tell them this is an important bill and why it's important. You give them the details, you talk to their staff and get them signed up. Back to you, Susan. Thank you. And perhaps um, uh, Commissioner Garcia Richard, would you like to weigh in on that? I think uh, maybe one of the first things to do is just look at a statewide uh, corridors act. Um, you know, I, obviously you've seen uh, the, the samples here today um, and look at the votes on those, on those statewide acts and they were by and large, um, you know, largely by, bipartisan. Yeah. yeah. Susan? Yes, Senator. This, this Dave, and uh, you know, that is uh, 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 a critical thing is bringing the public and, and, the, and, and government together in a public-private partnership to do some of these things. We have a good tradition here in Virginia of, of, of the private uh, sector, if you will, and private organizations raising money for bike trails. And I think there's a great potential when, when the wildlife crossings are identified uh, that uh, uh, after they're identified, that that we raise money from from private groups and 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 public dollars from the general fund and in Virginia, and the cooperative effort using using the labor of volunteers and what have you to put this fencing up to to install whatever's needed to make that crossing work. And that's something that I'd like to see, and, and that's something that appeals to everybody—Democrats, Republicans, 
everybody loves communitarian uh, involvement in public projects. Thank you very much. Um, I know we have uh, our scientists here and I want to throw a question out in their direction as well. Um, perhaps you could share very shortly because our time is unfortunately short, but a quick um, story about a success that you have been experiencing with wildlife corridors because we understand a lot of your work has been, you know, it's very compelling and successful on the ground. So maybe a quick story, perhaps Ron, you could start off. <clears throat> sure, sure. So one one very large and effective wildlife corridor that has been developed recently um, uh, was the Pinhook Swamp down in Florida, which connects Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge with uh, the Osceola National Forest. So it's a, it's a it's the right size of right shape of a corridor. It's short and squat, and it connects these two big blocks of of federal public land. And it was a great conservation success story getting that done. And in Florida, in general, it needs a shout out for all the great work that they've done protecting their ecological greenways network. So, thanks, Ron and Aaron. Well, I'll, I'll just have to give another shout out to our kind of our local efforts. Uh, um, again, we we're here in southern Colorado, and um, you know, with our myself as a tribal biologist working with state biologists and collecting you know, lots of movement data for our ungulates down here and, and in turn turning that over and working with uh, CDOT to, to get this, um, this latest project, our, our wildlife crossing project on US Highway 160 that's gonna be kicking off here in the spring. Um, I, I think that's gonna be extremely successful as we heard, uh, you know, we, we expect our wildlife vehicle collisions in that project area to drop precipitously. Um, and it's, it's a really, it's a good story. And not only is this, um, um, you know, movement between public federal lands and tribal lands. Um, you know, this this corridor al also spans uh, interstate. So we've got animals moving through Colorado, through tribal nations into New Mexico. So, um, you know, it's, it's a work in progress, but it's already been a success story and, and we expect more in the future. Thank you, Aaron. I mean, I have one uh, question from the chat. Um, uh, this is uh, from, I think, New Mexico. It says we're, we're grateful for the work that they're doing there, but are there actions the state can do or perhaps the feds can do to stop additional border wall construction um, in collaboration with the Biden administration? I don't know, maybe I'll kick that to Senator Udall and, and uh, Commissioner mm -hmm. Greg Richard. Thank, thank you so much. I, I think one of the things that has been so destructive in the Trump administration is this border wall because many of the areas <clears throat> were areas where we had crossings between Mexico and the United States of wildlife. And many of them, if you've been down there on the border in New Mexico, they're wild areas. We actually have an endangered jaguar that has been spotted moving from Mexico into the United States. And so what's happened is they've gone and built border wall in areas where maybe there's only a hundred people that even try to cross and these really, desolate areas and they build a border wall at the tune of sometimes 40 million dollars a mile. Uh, big waste of money, very bad for ecosystems, bad for species and, and uh, Biden's going to stop it. He's going to stop it and then I think what we need to do is talk about the wall that's already been put up and how we deal to can interconnect the wildlife corridors that have now been blocked with that wall. Stephanie, to you. Right, Senator. I, I think um, there's going to be a lot of sort of TLC that needs to, to happen. So, you know, on top of the humanitarian, social justice, public safety issues, we have habitats that are being, um, you know, decimated and destroyed by, by the construction of this wall. There is state trust land along the border. Um, we, you know, have vehemently um, stood up to folks coming to our office with, with proposed contracts and leases to use state trust land in that area. Um, we've held firm, but it's just, you know, it's just kind of a drop in the bucket. So we look forward, we look forward to the, the positive work that will be, have to be done to restore um, some of the, the fragmented habitat in that area and um, just wanna, you know, commit ourselves to that at this time. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia Richard. And I see we are reaching six o'clock. Um, I don't know if uh, Senator Udall and uh, the rest of the panelists can see in the chat, but there has been so much love from the over, at one point, over 300 participants on this uh, Zoom call. 
So I want to convey all of that love to you, all panelists. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Senator, for your leadership and your commitment to wildlife corridors and the work that you are doing and continue to do. Um, uh, a recording of this webinar will be available. And for more information about how you can protect wildlife corridors and crossings, please visit the Wildlands Network website at www.wildlandsnetwork.org. Again, I want to thank all of you for coming and a special and warmest thanks to all the speakers who gave the time um, and uh, their wisdom today on this call. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank thanks, you all. Guys.